is going to go. Now, one of the things to recognize is what this has always been about, all this stuff we talk about and do, is the customer's experience. It's emotional. Look, you know, I have this, I guess I'll call it a mantra for the sake of any better. It's called, kind of a weird mantra, though. Uh, it's, you don't have to have luxury, you just have to feel luxurious, right? And that's, re that's the reality of it. You know, I mean, look, think of it, sometimes you're wrapped in a giant bath towel that's soft and you feel great, and the bath towel probably costs like, what, 40 bucks? But that's not luxury, but it feels really good, and you, and you feel great. And that's what we're talking about when push comes to shove here. We're talking about an emotional response. We're talking about emotional interaction. We're talking about a commitment of some sort that is sustained with a business based on those emotional interactions, not on simply the discounts and purchases, but the good feeling you get from those discounts and purchases. I'll give you an example. OK, I, I, you're a value, I, I, I write you a note. And you're a customer of my company. And it says, well, because you're a valued customer, uh, I want to give you a 20% discount on all your products this month. And then I would write you the same note next month, and the same note next month, and the same note next month. So I give it to you for, say, six months in a row. You feel pretty good. You're being valued. You're getting 20% off. You're getting something for feel, and, and you feel good about that. All right? Another one. I write you another note. It says, you know what? Um, you're a pain in the ass and a schmuck, and I'm going to give you a 30% discount because I just want you off my back, right? And I do that for six months. How are you going to feel at the end of six months? Are you going to be a customer still? I'm going to call you a schmuck and a pain in the ass every single month for six months. A bigger discount, though, 30%. What it, where does the utility and the emotion start to change, right? It change, part of discounts and part of purchases that you make are because you, when you get those discounts, you do, if they're special because you're in a loyalty program, you feel valued. And that's emotional. And that's what this is about. So these trends are all based around customer experience. But business side, because there's a lot of operations and transactions you've got to deal with, business side, you've got to measure this stuff. Because that's, when push comes to shove, your job depends on it. It's not just that the business has to measure it. Your job depends on it. So, and you know, the other side to keep in mind about all of this is we're always dealing with self-interest. Always. We're all self-interested, every single one of us. And that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing, really. It's what makes us individual. We have different hopes. We have different dreams. We have different stresses. We have different things we'd like to do with our life here, something we want to do tomorrow. All of them are different. But we want to do them, and we're individuals. And those indiv as individuals, we're accomplishing self-interest throughout our entire life. Businesses, unfortunately, on both ends, have to deal with that. They have to deal with my individual self-interest, because I don't want to be Paul Greenberg, uh, Jewish, New Yorker, Yankee fan. I want to be Paul Greenberg, me, and detail about me, and you would treat me like different than other Jewish, New York, Yankee fans. Right? So I want to be treated as me. And I don't want to be treated as Paul Greenberg, the right, -wing, uh, the right wing syndicated columnist who writes for the Arkansas Traveler Gazette, who actually exists. Uh, he won a Pulitzer, too. Uh, so I don't want to be him. I want to be this Paul Greenberg. So businesses have to deal with that. That's one thing. The other side is everyone in business is self-interested. So they don't just want to do something good for the company. They want to do something good for themselves that if it's good for the company, that's good, too because that's how they do something for themselves. And it's always that. And this is what we have to measure on both ends. So what we have now is a situation where we're dealing with the emotional experience of customers. We're dealing with trying to figure out how to measure it. We're dealing with providing customers with a okay, way of engaging with us. And we're dealing with enormous amounts of information just sitting out there that can give us that detail that we need to enhance the experience of those customers, which is why we're seeing knowledge management begin to move quickly. But look at the number we're dealing with. IDC came out with a stat uh, this be, that, that by the end of last year, there were 1.2 zettabytes of data out there. Now, I didn't even know what a zettabyte was. I actually thought it was like, oh, zettabyte, that's married to Michael Douglas byte. 
right? I mean, right, I had no idea what we were talking about here. This is 10 to the 21. Okay, it's 10 to the 21, and we're dealing with that much data out there. But you know what? It's data. It doesn't mean it's, it's not insight. It's data. It's not even knowledge yet. So the idea is how do you capture, organize, use, and expose it to people who can then get insight from it so that they can serve their customers better and, and provide some of that to the customers so that, in fact, they can interact with your company in a more intelligent way. We're starting to see that everywhere. And again, we'll get into examples shortly on this stuff. Because if you don't do that, if you don't organize that, if you don't do things, I mean, that's one of the reasons, honestly, you know, and I'm, I'm not, look, I'm a New Yorker, as I said, and the reality is I'm not a cheerleader for anybody. I really, I mean, I'm actually known for being, let's say, I can be um, reasonably tough on vendors and I, publicly. But I have to tell you, the insights stuff just like blows me away. I love it. Because, in fact, it takes that and does something real with it. You know? And I don't often sit and endorse a product ever on a stage, ever. But this one really like, got me. Because that does, it provides a capability to do things like that. And that's what we're looking for now. The other side is analytics. Right now we're starting to say, look, the interesting thing is, if you look at sentiment analysis, for the most part, it's positive, negative, neutral. Because we have, again, we're talking about customer experience. We're talking about emotional responses here. We actually have to identify an emotional response from a customer when we're doing the analytics. And because we're dealing with millions of them, it has to be somewhat automated. You can't just have everyone look over every manual, you know, every tweet manually. So the problem is, though, positive, negative, neutral is really lousy ways of looking at emotion. And in fact, what we're starting to see is much more granular things occurring. And, you know, we have a huge granular understanding of who we are. So, for example, um, okay, so I do this exercise when I, we have two days of social serum training, and it says, this is empty boxes, and on the left it says, um, on the left it says, uh, in love with, then love, then like a lot, then eh, then dislike a lot, and then hate. And the idea is that every student who fills it out has five minutes to fill out those boxes with a person or a thing that fits those emotional states. And you know, in all the time I've done this so over the last few years, no one has ever failed to do it in five minutes. That's how granular our actual emotional understanding is. But if I ask you, tell me the difference emotionally in a scale of one to five between 4.2 and 4.7, you can't. You can't. But we understand our own emotions that granularly. Well, businesses have to understand us at that level of granularity. We're starting to see analytics platforms and programs that can do that. They can say, oh, they're irritated, they're mildly upset, they're furious. We're starting to see that now, too. And that's the kind of stuff we're beginning to go on. The other thing I'm going to do, because uh, I think I'm already out of time, but I tend to go over all the time. Um, the other thing I do is I want to go through is mobile. Again, communications revolution is how we communicate. Let me ask, okay, so how many people here, since I started, have at least looked at their mobile device? Yeah, 100%, right? I could have answered that for you, actually. Um, and and I, you might not have even tweeted. You're looking at email, you're, you're fiddling with a button. I mean, whatever. You did something because you're kind of wedded to it. The rea that is reality now, and that reality is is that mobile, a mobile business becomes a very important facet of what we're doing. We're on the go. And the more we understand that, the better. And we have platforms out there that will organize and format things in the way you want to see it that are social CRM platforms and CRM platforms that are coming out every day. But the mobile devices and mobile CRM and mobile social CRM are critical because, in fact, of that communications revolution. Now, what I'm going to do, I think, because of time, is let's start looking into the, uh, the actual way that this thing works now. Because, you know, there's a whole thing on measurement and how this works. Well, they actually can be measured. First of all, I just want to address one thing on ROI. You know, people ask me that constantly. Well, what's the ROI? How the hell do I know? I don't know your business. I have to know your business to know how to even think of an ROI. Your return on investment as a business is going to be different than someone else's. 
Okay, and basically ROI, because it's essentially an objective that you want to meet one way or the other, and some, so it could be attached to some financial objective or not, right? ROI is going to be determined business by business. So you can't answer that in any universal uh, 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 generic way. It has to actually, it's a, it takes a, it's a process, it takes work to actually figure it out, and then you figure out how to measure it. Now, you know, remember Adam Gross had this yesterday? I was actually thinking maybe I'll sue Adam for doing this, and then I realized, well, actually, Einstein could sue both of us. So I figured I'd leave this alone. But look at this. That quote's really important. Not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. This intangible is built into this. Advocacy is not entirely measurable, is not entirely tangible. Your customer's going out there, they're advocating for you, doing things on your behalf that, in fact, are partly emotional because they really like who you are. All right, so we're going to look at a couple of case studies and then close with um, um, a whole thing on how to look at the actual valuation of this stuff. So think of this. Remember I was talking earlier, I'd say I'd talk about a major tactical success that was a major strategic failure? Here it is, Comcast 2010. All right? Now, that said, I love Frank Eliason. He's a friend of mine. I've known him for years. We're, we're, we're really close. I mean, really close. And Frank is a major success in what he has done and what he did. Now he's the senior vice president of social media at Citigroup. Note what he says. Some say there's no ROI to social. Others say there is, but it is not measurable. Don't they see the value in listening to the voice of their customer? There is true value there that's very measurable. Just keep that in mind. So for, these are stats you don't see about Comcast and some of the success on the social side that they had. They have forums where customers are answering questions uh, with each other. They, are, they, they, are, they, are highly, they have highly skilled and highly trained customer service people who are trained on the social side who are working on those forums to respond quickly. And I want you to know, 14 and a half million participants, look at that next number. Now you see FCR, and if you're a traditional contact center person or call center person, you'll think first call resolution. That's first contact resolution. Now, you understand, by the time you get to a phone call, it's expensive. The idea is $49 for the first phone call, $65 for the second, and $155 for the third. So the idea is never get there. These guys have solved 45% of the problems that they've gotten through the uh, forums have been solved on first contact. Another 35 second contact. They, they feel, what they think is they've saved $8 a call and they saw a $92.8 million save just by doing it through this forum. Another story. Thanks, this is thanks to Twitter. There was a Flyers game, because Comcast owns the Philadelphia Flyers. There's a Flyers game that was on TV, and there was a TV outage in Pittsburgh. Well, they saw the outage on Twitter much quicker than they had it reported via their traditional means. They just saw people tweeting, it's out, it's out, it's out. So it, they had a note, a note on there in seven minutes on their IVR message, rather than 30, which is what it usually takes them to get there. Their savings, 1.2 million, according to their metrics, because of Twitter, straight out. Comcast cares. We know that, right? He has 11, Frank has 11 people who have worked for him. Now it's someone else, but had 11 people work for him querying the, uh, querying the customers getting customer complaints, trying to resolve the complaints. Now, that was a tactical success. But here's the deal. Brian Roberts, who's the CEO of Comcast, he invested money in this. You know why? He saw it as a great PR move. What a great PR move. This isn't a PR move. This is a customer care move. And in fact, because he didn't replicate this to the rest of the company, here's the state of the rest of the company.